It was in the year 1967 that I watched television nonstop for six days and came to realize that God was the Lord of history and the King of the nations. It was the Six Day War in which Israel had that incredible victory that I knew as I watched the screen that you couldn't explain that victory in human terms alone. I went out to Israel immediately after the war and I was up on the Galan Heights with an Israeli army major and I looked at the, um, the rows and rows of Russian guns and the wrecked Russian tanks on the top of the Galan Heights looking down on the valley. And I said to this major, how on earth could you possibly take this hill? How could you get up here in the face of all that? And he didn't answer in words. He just went like this. That's all he did. By 1973, Israel had become proud and they thought they'd done it themselves. And I remember watching the victory parade on May Day or the state the day of independence of the state of Israel. And as I watched the proud parade of the Israeli troops, I rem remember turning to someone and saying, God will have to do something to humble this people. And a few months later, the Arabs marched on Yom Kippur in that day of October 1973, and Israel's pride was smashed. You see God's hand in history both in victory and defeat. And it was from those days in 1967 that I began to think of God as not just the head of the church, but the king of the nations, and saw history as his story. And I remember going by the invitation of Mr. George Thomas, the former speaker of the House of Commons, and a very God-fearing man, on his retirement, Mr. Thomas said, when he mentioned God in the House of Commons, he felt old-fashioned. That's quite a comment on our government. But he invited me to speak to, the mem to members of both Houses of Parliament, and I spoke to them about God's ancient people, Israel. And I showed them how six English prime ministers, sorry, British prime ministers, six, <laughs> I must remember where I am, how six prime ministers in my lifetime have gone into the political wilderness within days or weeks of breaking faith with the people of God called Israel. From Neville Chamberlain through Winston Churchill, in 1945, Anthony Eden, right through to James Callaghan, six prime ministers in my lifetime had lost all political power within days or weeks of breaking a promise to God's ancient people. One prime minister who not only kept every promise, but stayed faithful to that people at risk to his own life and contrary to the advice of those around him, had the longest term in office of any prime minister this century and was not voted out when he decided to retire. And that was Harold Wilson. I am not now taking political sides. I am pointing out a very real factor. But after I had shared these things with members of both houses of parliament, I remember a man getting up, his face was red with anger, a prominent MP, and he said, what about free will? I'm here because I chose to be a member of parliament, and I'm here because my constituency chose me as their member. I said, you have free will, so have your constituents. But God has more free will than you have. And God has the casting vote in any election. The thought that God was in charge of the British government was anathema to that man. 
He resented the idea that God decides the result of elections. He resented the idea that God chose and unchose prime ministers of Britain. And in fact, the human heart rebels against any idea that God is in charge. It's amazing that at the same time they have a chaplain in the House of Commons to make the usual salute to God in a prayer at the beginning of each session. But in fact, when you uncover the hearts of many MPs, there is a sheer resentment against the belief in the kingdom of God. Now, we must explore this morning the strange contradiction between faith and facts, or rather between what we believe and what we see. Because this world doesn't look as if it's under the complete control of God, does it? There are many, many things happening in our world that are very difficult to explain if you believe that God is in control. I start with one of the most difficult, and that is the subtle shift in world climate in 1971, which has narrowed all the rain belts of our globe and led to the situation where many countries are suffering appalling drought and others are suffering floods. There has been a redistribution of rainfall since 1971. And the meteorologists can't explain it. But it is causing widespread suffering. So it's not just in political affairs, but in natural affairs. It doesn't look as if God is in charge. And when I say that God is on the throne and in total control of the situation, I'm speaking by faith. But I didn't read it in this morning's newspaper. I believe it, but I don't see it. And when I look at the violence, when I hear wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes, what I see tells me that the thing is out of control. And this contradiction between what we believe and what we see has to be faced very honestly and squarely and explained. Now, there are two explanations which I want to reject, which I hear from people. One is that God is a bad king and is mismanaging the universe. The other is that God is a weak king and can't do any more about it than we can. Now, those two explanations are quite widespread. Every time somebody says, why does God allow that? They are saying he's a bad king. Or they're saying he's a weak king. But the implication is one or the other. Every time people complain that God should have stopped this or started that or done the other, they are saying he's not a good king. Now, when you believe in the God of the Bible, you cannot possibly explain this contradiction in terms of God being a bad king. Every page from the very first page tells us that good God is the essence of our theology. When people ask me to speak and, and want a subject months before I arrive in a place, I never know what to say, so I usually say, well, tell them I'll speak on good God. That covers all my theology and everything I want to say. But I arrived at a university in Auckland in New Zealand, and to my horror there were posters everywhere which looked like an, an outlaw wanted poster with a horrible photograph of myself over most of the sheet, a sort of suit and whitewash, you know, these black and white pictures. And above it just said, good God, exclamation <laughs> mark. And underneath it gave the date and the hall, and that's all it said. And everywhere I looked in the university was this dreadful face and good God above it. But at least it, it got a packed lecture theater for the very first meeting. And uh, I spoke about good God. That is fundamental to the Bible, that God is good. That therefore everything he does is good. It's got to be. 
everything he made with his hands, he stood back and said, that's good. That's a good job. And when he made you and me, he said, that's very good. The thought that the world is in a mess because God is bad is unthinkable to the Christian. Many years ago, a man said to me, the world's in a hell of a mess, isn't it? I said, if you're using that word like I would use it, you're not far off the truth. What about the explanation that God is a weak king, which as I explained yesterday is now being touted by bishops and may become official doctrine in the Church of England? That poor old God needs our help because he's looking at the world and wringing his hands, doesn't know what to do with it. That's not the concept of God as a good king. But many people have come to believe that God is weak, that he's helpless in the face of the many things that are happening in our world and can't stop it, and, and really is a very disappointed, frustrated God. That's not the answer either. What then is the answer to this mess in which the world is? For the last 4,000 4, years of history, there have only been 300 years of peace. Let that sink in. Only 300 years in which you could say there is no major war taking place. In the last 4,000 years. In my lifetime, millions have been slaughtered. More people have died violently in Russia than in the whole of the World War II. And we live in a dreadful world. And here we are, we go out to that world and we say, God is on the throne. God is in control. God has the last word. And people say, it doesn't measure up. I can't figure it out. He's a funny sort of God to let all this happen. Well, the third explanation is the one the Bible gives. And that explanation is that part of God's creation was given the vote. Not the vote to vote him in or out, but the vote to vote themselves in or out. And to two parts of God's creation, God gave the power of the vote to the human race, that's us, and to the angelic host, that's them. And the Bible is absolutely clear that the whole of the human race and a third of the angelic host exercised their vote to opt out of being subject to the king. And that the explanation to the mess we're in lies in the incredible tolerance of God in allowing that to take place. He must have known it would happen. If you don't understand that God is a prodigal father, you better read the book again. I, I call the story in Luke 15 the parable of the prodigal father. Why? Because he gave his sons the money. Incredible. He must have known what the younger son would do with it, but he gave him the money. What a prodigal father. I'm amazed at what God has allowed me to do. He could have stopped me at any point, yet he let me do it. He's a prodigal father. He's a king who for reasons best known to himself has decided that part at least of his creation should have the vote to opt out of his kingdom. And I believe the basic reason why he did that was that his heart was for voluntary subjects. For those who weren't forced to do his will. He got pleasure out of the mountains and the winds and the hills and the waves and the animals and the birds because they had to do his will. And they gave him pleasure and he created all things for his pleasure. But he knew that he could never get the same pleasure 
from things and beings, creatures that were forced to be his subjects, as he would have from those who voluntarily said, we accept your sovereignty. That, I believe, lies at the heart of the mystery of the mess. And we find right at the beginning of the Bible that man was faced with a choice. He was offered the sovereignty of all that God had made. When you consider this planet, the astronauts who went to the moon said that this planet was the most beautiful thing they saw. I remember Jim Irwin coming to our home from Meeland. Just to talk with a man who's played golf on the moon is quite an experience. Incidentally, that man was the man who took sin to the moon. I don't know if you know the story, but he decided to smuggle aboard the lunar module hundreds of stamps, which he was going to frank or stamp on the moon, and he knew he could sell them for a thousand dollars each when he got back home. And they were not allowed to take anything undeclared on that trip. But he managed to smuggle hundreds of stamps, which he was going to sell to philatelists when he got back. Well, he discovered that philately will get you nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, on the moon, on the moon, while he canceled those stamps, he was convicted of sin. And he came straight back to earth and went straight and got baptized to get clean in God's sight. But I remember him telling us that the sight of planet earth as they came back was beautiful. Here is the only planet in the whole universe as far as we know that is two-thirds water, which is fundamental to our life. It's a beautiful planet. It's green. It's packed with life. Just a handful of soil is packed with life. And God said, man, it's yours. I'm delegating my sovereignty to you. As far as creation goes, those animals, those birds, the whole lot is yours. You rule over it. You control it. You fill it, you inhabit it, you garden it, you look after it, but it's yours, provided you are my subject. And provided you acknowledge my sovereignty, it will not be a heavy burden. It just means that out of all the trees I've made, there's one you don't touch, that's all. I remember a boy in the RAF coming to me when I was a chaplain and saying, what about this story I've just read about the Garden of Eden? He said, is that true? I said, listen, suppose I put you in a library where there were thousands of fascinating books, more than you could read in your lifetime. And I left you alone in that library, and you noticed that on the top shelf there was a book that said not to be read by anyone under 21. And I leave you alone in that library. There are all the books you could ever enjoy. What are you going to do? And he grinned and he said, I guess it must be true. <laughs> and he realized it was true of him. That something in human nature says, I will not be told. We've got three children. I'm sure you've discovered with your children as somebody wrote to me, the trouble with having children is that you see your own faults developing in them. Did you notice that your child learned to say no before they learned to say yes? Did you notice you never had to teach them to be dishonest, only to be honest? Did you notice you never had to teach them to be cruel, only to be kind? Did you notice you never had to teach them how to hide things from you? But you had to wheedle things out of them to share with you. Why? We've got to go back to the very beginning. And we've got to realize the simple truth 
that there are in fact two kingdoms here on earth. And that we are involved in a mortal conflict between them. We do not start life innocent. However nice that little baby looks, the simple fact is it was born in the wrong kingdom. And you're a fool if you think otherwise. In fact, I looked early this morning at one verse and, and just let it sort of sink in. It's a dreadful verse. It's in the New Testament. It says, we know we belong to God. We also know that the whole world lies in the control of the evil one. Now, do you know that? The previous verse, by the way, is equally challenging. It says, whoever is born of God does not go on sinning. So one of the marks of someone who's been born again is that they don't go on sinning. I'll come back to that later. A subject of the kingdom doesn't go on sinning. In other words, the church is not a home for incurables. It's a hospital for sinners. But it turns out saints. Well, now let's go right back to man saying, God, I don't want to be a tenant on planet earth, I want to be landlord. I resent being a subject. I resent being told what to do. There are two ways to moral experience. One is to allow yourself to be a subject and to be told what is right and wrong without sampling them. The other is to say, I won't have you telling me what to do. I will taste these things and I will decide for myself what is good for me and what is bad for me. And the Bible teaches us that from the very beginning, that, was, that second choice was the one that the human race made. And you know, you see every generation making it. I can remember my first cigarette. I was, uh, let's see, it would be about ten and a half years old. I could take you to the bush where I hid, and where we smoked to pack it through. I had been told not to. I had been told it would be bad for me. But I was jolly well going to find out. And I found out, and I was pretty sick. And I had tasted it and found it was not good for me. From one point of view, I'm jolly grateful I did, because I've never wanted one since. So I've never been able to sympathize with those. By the way, you don't smoke the cigarettes. You're the sucker. <laughs> it's the cigarette that smokes. Um, but anyway, um, I can make these cheap jokes because it's not one of my temptations. But I discovered this, and you will discover this, that you can never know good and evil as God knows them. God knows good first-hand and evil second-hand. When you've tried both, you will know evil first-hand and good second-hand. I wonder if you know what I, I mean by that. I mean that if you are not willing to be subject and to be told by someone else what is good and evil, you lose your innocence. And you can never regain it. Let's take sex outside marriage. And some two-thirds of sixth-form youngsters have had sex outside marriage. They have tried it. They may have heard that it was wrong, but they've tried it. I think there are young people here listening to me right now who've tried it. And you've tasted it. And some of you have found that outside of a loving, loyal relationship, it can go pretty stale or sour. It can even put someone off you. But the thing you can never get back is your innocence. You can never go back to that innocence you had before you took of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Do you hear what I mean? 
Many of us would love to go back and get our innocence in certain areas back again. But you can't. Even divine grace and forgiveness can never change your past. Can change your future. Can restore broken relationships. But it can never restore innocence when the what we call the prodigal son came home. He didn't get the money back. That was spent was gone. In other words, there are consequences of rebellion which you never get over. There are penalties which can be forgiven. That's a very important distinction. If I steal apples and get the tummy ache, that's a consequence. If I get uh, six of the best, and the Board of Education applied to the seat of learning as a result of stealing those apples. That's the penalty. And forgiveness can remove the penalty, but it can't remove the tummy ache. Do you follow me? And God said, I'm to be sovereign, you are to be subject, and you can have control of the whole universe. I retain the right to decide what's good and evil. You don't decide from your own experience. I will tell you what is good and evil. And you are my subject and you don't touch that experience for yourself. That's the meaning of the Garden of Eden. There was a beautiful place, but that one tree stood for one thing that God was sovereign. And man was to be subject. And had it stayed that way, it would have been paradise. But I find still that right through the human race, there is an attitude, I'm not going to have God telling me what's right and wrong for me. I'll decide for myself. I'll try it, and I'll decide afterwards. But you are prejudiced afterwards. You're marked afterwards. You're marred. And there isn't one person listening to me now who has not lost innocence. In fact, that means there is not one of you now who is the person you might have been by now had you been subject to the will of God. There's only been one life ever lived in whom God was well pleased. Only one. God knows what I could have been by now had I let him be sovereign. He knows. And the result is the human race has set about building its own kingdoms, some of them big, some of them small. What's your kingdom? It could be just your house and your garden. That's my little kingdom in which I do what I want and what I decide is good. Others have had overweening ambition to have the biggest kingdom of all. I'm old enough to remember Hitler's ravings about the thousand-year Reich, the kingdom. And you, Bernard, remember Idi Amin's ambition of the same sort, to have a kingdom, to be boss, to be the big person. Some of you ladies could be doing that within your own home and family. But we want our own kingdoms. The result is, secondly, that we decide we'll have our own kind of gods. That's what we call idolatry. And whether you make a god of wood or stone, or whether you just construct a god of your own imagination and say, well, this is what I think God is like, that's manipulating God because you manipulate what you make. And you've got God nicely bottled up in your own ideas. We don't have many idols in the, in the shape of wood or stone in this country, but I meet dozens of people who've got idols because when I tell them what God is really like, they often say, but I don't think God is like that. No, I think God is like this. For example, you tell them about hell, oh, I don't think God would ever send anybody to hell except Hitler and Idi Amin. You know? That's their idea of God. In fact, 
I would dare to say that most people's idea of God in these islands is of a grandfather rather than a father. That is their image of God, a nice old boy who wants us to be happy and pats us on the head and said, we'll forgive and forget. Now what can I do for you next? That's not the picture of God in the Bible. It's an idol. And once you make an image of God, once you make your own idea of God, once you fashion God according to what you think he should be like, the very next step is immorality, which always follows idolatry, because you then bend the rules. You then start saying, well, this is what I think is right, and this is what I think is wrong. My wife and I had an interesting experience at Lincoln Showground the other week. Uh, I was speaking in the, to a large gathering of young people called Fresh Ground over the August Bank holiday there, and, and we had a staff room where we relaxed between sessions. And, and I went through to this room and somebody says, said, oh, there's a couple here um, and there's a man who wants to talk to you. So I was introduced. Uh, a very godly woman had brought this man along. They were neighbors, I think. And um, she said, he, he wants to challenge you. So I said, go ahead. And he turned out to be a very convinced left-wing radical socialist. And he really believed that that was the answer and that he was devoting his life to a cause that would really change the world. He said he'd, he wanted to help mankind. And at last, he said, I feel I've found the real answer. And he felt that what I'd been saying was quite beside the point and quite irrelevant. So he let me have an earful of his... And he was, the man was sincere. It's great to meet somebody who really wants to make this world a little, a little better rather than just look after himself and his family. But nevertheless, the Lord led me to say something to him, which was this. Stealing is stealing. And you either play by the rules or you don't. I had no idea that that was to be God's word that touched his inmost soul. He didn't show anything at the time, but he went away from me. And, you know, it was one of those encounters. You think, well, did I get through at all? Did I say anything to him? He went and sat in the main hall. I wish I had his letter with me. He says it was as if I was a little sheep. And a shepherd came and clipped me. And I just was shorn of everything. <laughs> and he was just blown apart. And the Lord just met him because of that statement, stealing is stealing. And it just touched him with one of God's laws of his kingdom. Because with all his humanitarianism, with all his socialism, with all his desire to better mankind, in God's sight he was a thief. And he justified it to himself. He said it's all right in the situation we are today. It's all right to take that from the firm or whatever it was. But God touched him. He signed the letter, late of planet Earth. <laughs> I thought, as a man free from the kingdom of Earth, he's in the kingdom of heaven. So that the first step after we've declared UDI against God, a unilateral declaration of independence, said, right God, from now on I decide for myself, and the vast majority of Scots, have done just that. You did it once. You may still be doing it. But the vast majority of Scots are not subjects of the king. Most of them decide for themselves what they will do and what is good and what is bad. And the next step is they've got to construct an idol. They've got to fill the God-shaped blank with a God of their own idea. And the next step is to bend the rules. Because if you can make a God whom you can manipulate, you can then manipulate the, t the Ten Commandments any way you like. And you can make your own rules for yourself. Now the serious side of all this is that wherever there is an atmosphere of rebellion against authority, that actually allows room for a strong man to come in with a much more burdensome kingdom. And time and again, you hear countries where there's been a revolution 
in the name of freedom that has finished up with a worse dictatorship than before the revolution. Why? Because where there is an atmosphere of rebelling against any authority, an authoritarian leader will get his chance to come in and offer to bring order out of the chaos that has resulted. That's the pattern of history. And I want to tell you that we live in a world and in a nation where there is an atmosphere of rebellion against authority. Starting with the home, which is where the first breakdown of authority occurs. But I tell you this, no government can keep its authority in a nation where parental authority has gone. Just can't do it. Once parental authority goes, every other authority will collapse sooner or later. Now, what does that leave? It leaves a vacuum, and I tremble. Tell you what's happening in our government at the moment. We're getting a polarized situation in which we could finish up with either a radical right or a radical left, promising to bring us out of our troubles. In fact, that will be exactly the strategy of Antichrist, who will promise to bring peace and security to a chaotic world. Where there is rebellion against authority, some strong power will get in there. And therefore, when human beings said to God, we will not have you reign over us, we will not obey your commandments, we'll decide what's right and wrong, we'll decide about marriage, we'll decide about life, we'll decide whether abortion is murder or not, we'll decide all these things. What happened? Satan got his chance. And it isn't that we got our freedom. We just got ourselves into another kingdom where the burdens far outweighed the benefits. We accepted another sovereignty other than God's, but the price of subjection to that sovereign we didn't guess. I regard Satan as the great drug push pusher. That's his method. He's a drug pusher. He offers in his sovereignty anything we want, any pleasure we want, any power we want, any fame we want. They are his to give too. Since he controls this world, he can offer you anything in this world you want. But the price you pay is an addiction which enslaves you to him. He even tried it on Jesus. He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Did you notice that Jesus didn't quarrel and say, but they're not yours to give? Jesus never took Satan lightly. He said, I'm not going to be your subject. I serve only one king. And I'm not accepting the kingdoms of the world on your terms. Most of us do. And Satan knows this inside out. And he can suggest to us, if this is what you want, I'll give it to you. Just bow down and serve me. I've already got a little further than I meant to. So let me backtrack a bit. Unless you realize that there is a higher order of intelligent life in the universe than men, you will not make sense of what I'm saying. No evolutionist I've ever heard talks about angels. Have you ever noticed that? Because they just don't fit the scheme. Angels did not evolve from men. So your evolutionist cannot cope with angels. And so modern man is left with an empty universe. And we feel desperately lonely in an empty universe. The thought that we're the only beings who can talk to each other in the entire universe is horrifying. And so what do we do? We populate the universe with fantasies of our imagination. I tell you, this generation is more drawn to E.T. than J.C. And E.T. is a pure figment of imagination. He's an idol. 
Yet the youngsters think he's great. What are we trying to do? We felt so lonely in the universe because we ruled God out, we ruled angels out. Neither of them fitted the evolutionary system. We are the highest products. We are the top of the ladder of life. And we felt so lonely we had to start populating outer space with creatures of our own imagination. And science fiction packs the bookshelves. We felt so lonely. Indeed, we felt so helpless before some of the creatures of early science fiction that it was only a matter of time till somebody produced an E.T. who would touch our pity and kind of make us feel at home with creatures from outer space. When Yuri Gagarin went out into space and came back, he was asked if he'd seen any angels. And he said, no, I didn't see any. But they saw him. An American astronaut was nearer the truth when he was asked, did you meet God? And he said, no, but if I'd stepped out of my spacesuit, I would have done. <laughs> Listen, this universe is populated through and through. There is an intelligent order of life above us, but below God. And not only was the human race given the vote to vote out of the kingdom of God, but that higher order of beings we call angels was also given the vote. And that higher order of beings took advantage of our rebellion to establish control on planet Earth. That's the biblical explanation of the mess we're in. We have been invaded from outer space. And there are thousands of people who are possessed by intelligent life that is not their own. And they need deliverance. They are in another kingdom. Now, I'm going to speak this morning about the kingdom of Satan. And I would tremble to do that if Christ were not in this room. Never laugh at the devil. Make fun of him, you're in his grip. Treat him very seriously indeed. But he's not God. Let me just say a few things about him. And you know, whenever I've spoken about him, I get conscious of being involved in, in a battle. Some of the tapes I've made about Satan have been more interfered with electronically than any other tapes I've made. So I don't underestimate Satan, but I want to tell you he's not God. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. And he's not omnipresent. If those words are a bit big for you, well, big words stand for things. Delicatessen and other big words, but let's take those three words. Omnipotence means all-powerful, able to do anything. Omniscient means knowing everything. And omnipresent means being everywhere at the same time. God is all those three things, but Satan is not. One of the biggest mistakes that Christians make is to think that Satan's everywhere at the same time. He's not. He's an angel. He can only be in one place at the same time. And sometimes you get a bit big-headed if you think Satan's giving you exclusive attention. I don't know where he is at this moment. But I do know this, that Satan, according to the Bible, is the head of a kingdom and he's got agents everywhere. And mostly what you experience is one of his agents. I'm saying that for a specific reason. When God said once to Satan, where have you been? He said, going to and fro in the earth. He can travel with the speed of light but he can't be everywhere at once. So he uses agents. I'm telling you that because many people think he's omnipresent and that he's with them in the train, with them in the office, and with them wherever they are. Don't fool yourself. He's just an angel, so he can only be in one place at once. But he can travel through the air quicker than Concord. He's prince of the power of the air. But he runs a kingdom and I, I want to concentrate on this. You see, there are two errors that Christians make in relation to Satan. One is to blame him for everything. 
as if everything that goes wrong is personally to be attributed to Satan. That is to treat him far too lightly, not as a king. In fact, I remember somebody saying to me, oh, he said, it was a, a Tuesday night prayer meeting, and, and he came in and he said, oh, Satan's been getting at me all today. I said, tell me. Well, he said, I got up late. He said, I rushed my breakfast. That gave me indigestion. He said, I missed the train at the station. I saw it pull out just as I arrived. I arrived late at the office. I missed an important engagement. And he said, from then on, just every, my, said, Satan's really had a go at me today. I said, why did you get up late? He said, I forgot to set the alarm last night. I said, none of what you've told me has anything to do with Satan. You be careful about using him as a scapegoat for your own mistakes or folly or weakness. Now look, you be careful. We can't blame everything on Satan. That's to get it wrong. A lot of the trouble we get into is our own fault. and We did it by our own foolishness, our own mistakes, our own sins. So don't try and make him the scapegoat. But the opposite error is to limit the work of Satan to too narrow a field. And one of the dangers that Christians are in right now is that they think that Satan's work is almost exclusively occultism and spiritism and dabbling in black magic and so on. And therefore many Christians make the mistake of feeling, well, I've never used a Ouija board and I've never gone to a medium, so I'm all right. Don't you believe it? Satan is much more subtle than just to try and get people with Ouija boards. That's a more blatant and crude way. And certainly among unbelievers, it's an increasingly common way for him to get a hold of people. They do it first for a bit of fun. And then they find they're hooked. They read the horoscope for fun until it says something that fits. And then they wonder. And seven out of every ten people in Scotland read their horoscope every day. They're playing with fire. But if you think that Satan only deals with black magic and occultism, you are making a big mistake also. You've made his influence too narrow, as those who blame everything on him are making his influence too wide. So let me say a few more things about this creature. He's an angel. As we heard from Bernard last night, he decided that instead of being a subject like the other angels, he would be a king. And he chose as the place to be king this world. And he persuaded a third of his fellow angels to join him in the conspiracy. And therefore, he controls this world through those agents. And he operates far more commonly in both the world and in the church than we realize. And one of the urgent needs of today is not only that people come to faith in the kingdom of God, but that they also come to faith in the kingdom of Satan. Not faith in terms of trusting but faith in terms of believing that there is such a kingdom and learning to recognize it. I believe Satan has done more damage in the church than in the world. And his deception has done more to hold this world in his chains, his deception among clergy has done terrible damage to the world because I believe the church is responsible for the state of the world. Do you believe that? I, I don't have sympathy with Christians who point at the world and say, what a wicked world you are. How, what else could they be since they don't know God? We know God and we could have done something about that and prevented it. And I believe God holds his people responsible for the state of the nation in which he's placed them. And therefore it's we who need to repent for the nation. Nation can't repent for itself. So let's look further into the kingdom of Satan. He is a king. Jesus called him the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. And Paul calls him the God of this world. Those are very big titles to give. 
And the idea of Satan as a little imp with a fork in his hand and a forked tail running around in a red jumper suit, that kind of thing. Don't have anything to do with it. If, if the devil appeared like that to me, I'd have no problems. If someone looking like that knocked at my front door, I'd slam it in his face. Incidentally, increasingly in meetings recently, Satanists have turned up. And they've usually come all dressed in black and given the show away straight away. Satan is more subtle than that. He's a master of disguise. He can dress up as an angel of light, come to you even through your own nearest relative or friend, and you not know it. So he runs a kingdom, and he's a liar, he's a murderer, he's a killer, he's the father of lies, he hates. I tell you this, until you came to believe in God, you probably didn't believe in the devil either. But if you really met the Lord, you met the devil too. Do you know why? Because the devil isn't in hell. He's in heaven. As soon as you get through to heavenly places in Christ, you'll meet the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. That's serious. It means the holier you get, the better your prayer life, the more likely you are to wrestle with principalities and powers. So far from thinking that it's those dreadful people who play with the Ouija boards who have most problems with Satan, it's the saints who have most problems. And I think we need to realize this. At every point at which you are likely to become a better subject of the kingdom, you will have problems from the kingdom of Satan. It will probably be through one of his agents, called demons, evil spirits, whatever you call them, his agents. Let me just highlight, why is it such a battle for some people to get converted? Do you know what I mean? When they're getting near the kingdom, when they're getting interested in Christ, it seems as if somebody, the other side of them, is pulling hard. Have you had that experience? And it becomes a tug of war. I remember um, a couple coming to lunch with us, and um, I'm afraid I was rather showing off by telling a story of going up a river in Africa, in Kenya, not far from you, Bernard, where the crocodiles were all around and we were sitting on a little hollowed out tree trunk. <laughs> I felt those crocodiles were too near for... And, and the wife of the couple who were having lunch with us just capped the story beautifully. That's the penalty for telling a story that somebody else caps it with a better one, you know? But anyway... She said, uh, look at that scar, and here between her thumb and forefinger was a scar running back in that web of skin. And she said, do you know how I got that? She said, I was having a picnic by a river in Africa with my boyfriend. And uh, she said, I was washing up the dishes in the river afterwards. And she said, I had this big dinner plate in my hand, and suddenly out of the water came a big crocodile jaw and went <coughs> right on my hand. And the boyfriend, with great presence of mind, grabbed her ankles. And it was a tug of war between the boy and the crocodile for that girl. Because she'd got a dinner plate in her hand, the bottom teeth, the bottom jaw, couldn't grip. The top tooth had gripped right there in the skin. And eventually, she, the boyfriend's pulling ripped the skin and she was free. Have you ever felt like that when you're trying to win someone for Christ? As if all hell is let loose on the other side of them? And just everything conspires against? I tell you, Satan hates people getting converted. You're spoiling the strong man's goods. It is a warfare. You're not trying to persuade someone that life would be a bit nicer with Jesus. You're rescuing them from hell. You see, much evangelism is just uh, like to come along to our church. We have nice times there. You know, do nice things, meet nice people. <laughs> That's not what it's about. It's about releasing victims from their chains. Unless we take the kingdom of Satan seriously evangelism loses its cutting edge. 
It's just making nice people nicer. Do you know what I mean? Or take a next crisis. And here I'm going to follow up something that um, you mentioned last night, David. Baptism. Since I came here, somebody who's not with us today said something to me that sent a sword through my heart. He said, we were having lots of trouble over baptism, but we've agreed that it's not important. So we're over that problem now. And you know, I, I, I just felt hurt. I wanted to say, baptism not important? Was it not important to Jesus? That he made it so fundamental that he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and then teaching them all the rest. The one thing he singled out. The one thing they all did. Now I ask you, why is it that in England at any rate, a man can be an ordained clergyman dishing out Holy Communion and be a practicing homosexual. But if he gets baptized as a believer, he's out on his neck. Why? David's referring to the fact that a year ago, I wrote an article in a well-known Christian magazine on baptism. And I just tried to point out what the biblical meaning of it is. And they had the more, more correspondence from that article than they've had on any issue ever. Letter after letter shooting me down in flames until after seven months the editor called a halt to the correspondence. And I ask, why is there a furor over talking about baptism? And I'll tell you why. Behind that furor there's something demonic. There's the kingdom of Satan. And I'll tell you why again. Because he hates people to be baptized as a voluntary subject of the king. That's why. Because it is a weapon to be used against him. It's not a matter of churchmanship. It's a matter of the kingdom. It's the very first thing you do when you've become a subject. You submit to the Lord's will. Whether you like it or not, whether you get a blessing out of it or not, that's beside the point. He said, do it, and you do it. And forever afterwards, you can say to Satan, you have no dominion over me because I was buried with Christ in baptism. Thousands of people in this country are robbed of any meaningful relationship with their baptism. And I believe that one of the things that has been most damaging is the idea that you can be born into the kingdom. That if you've got Christian parents, you're born into the kingdom. Listen, the New Testament knows of no way of being born into the kingdom. You can be born again into the kingdom when you repent and believe. But this is an issue that Satan hates to be brought up. He can't bear it to be mentioned that baptism is a burial and a bath. It's a burial for those who've died and it's a bath for those who are dirty. He can't bear that to be done because it is so decisive for a subject of the kingdom that he will cause any argument any controversy, any threat to turn a person away from becoming a subject of the kingdom in that way. Now I speak strongly, but I believe I'm touching something that Satan hates me to mention. And he wants us to say it's not important. Let's just agree to differ. Let's get on with the important things. Well, to Jesus it was so important that even though he was the only person who didn't need to be baptized, at the age of 30, he said, it's right to do what's right. The next stage that Satan cannot bear in your life is when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. When you're plunged, drenched in him, I don't care what terms you use, terminology, if it's a source of division or disruption, that's... Okay, well, when I went to New Zealand, I was met by a group of ministers at the airport, and I said, now, are there any things I shouldn't mention in New Zealand, anything I shouldn't say, because I don't know New Zealand, and I've got a wonderful gift for putting my foot in my mouth. 
And they said, well, don't use the term baptized in the Holy Spirit. I said, why not? And they said, oh, it's, it's a hot potato here. Causes much division. So I said, all right, I won't. And I said, Holy Spirit, what shall I say instead? And he said, say drenched. So I just said, drenched in the Holy Spirit. And you know, everybody smiled. <laughs> Nobody got upset. Actually, it's a marvelous translation of the Greek word baptizein. But anyway, there it is. I learned later that there are three million people in uh, New Zealand, but um, about ten times that number of sheep. The word drench is used by every sheep farmer. And it was a term they used in ordinary speech from the sheep farming to mean just drenched. And uh, so I just hit on the right word. So if you object to being baptized in the Spirit, how about being drenched? Soaked, plunged, dipped, I don't care what term you use. But Satan hates that. And look what he's tried to do with the gift of tongues. Every gift that comes down from above is good and perfect. And Satan's managed to make that gift one of the things that people argue about and fear and muddle about. Hasn't he? As if God really made a big mistake to pour out that, that gift on the day of Pentecost. What a blunder. God, you might have chosen love or something nice. Why choose that? Have you noticed that in fact Satan doesn't trouble you all the time, but when you're on the verge of becoming a better subject of the king and submitting to something because you know God has told you, that's when he troubles you or sends along one of his agents. Let me go back to the world for a moment. You see, the evidence of Satan in the world is not just in the growth of glue sniffing. I see that science and education and the arts and entertainment and industry and politics all reflect his power in this world. It's not just in the perverted vices that you see Satan's authority. You can see his authority in every department of life. The New Testament is not playing with words when it says the whole world lies in his control. So take it seriously. Learn to recognize the kingdom of Satan wherever he's exercising his authority. There is indication in the scripture that he does have agents specifically detailed to exercise his authority over countries, over nations. Princes, they're called in the Bible, who rule over particular nations and who control them. The book of Daniel makes that quite clear. Listen, we are up against a highly organized kingdom. Let me come to the church, or before I leave the world, let me just say this. I, I wrote down early this morning, I must finish soon. I wrote down early this morning some of the characteristics of his kingdom, and they all seem to begin with the letter D. I'm not sure what the significance of that is. It may just be that I, I have a tendency to alliteration, which is the province of fools, poets, and Plymouth brethren, I'm told, but I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I just found that the devil has a kingdom of darkness, of disease, of deception, of division, of death. And I just had a whole long list of, of dreadful things which are his price. Take that world of darkness. What does it mean to call his kingdom the kingdom of darkness? I'll tell you what it means. His kingdom always has things to hide. If there are things in your life that you've got to hide, then there is ground for Satan to get a hold. I am bold now to say that one of his curses inside the church as well as outside is Freemasonry, which is a work of darkness. And if any men here have been involved in Freemasonry, I beg you to renounce it and to get all influence out of your life before you leave this conference. But when I say that, 
I said it in Lithgow, a mining town in Australia in February, and I did not know that the Masons so controlled that town that if you spoke against them, you couldn't buy groceries at the supermarket. And boy, when I mentioned Freemasonry there and found out it was riddled through the churches. Listen, it's a work of darkness. It's got things to hide. And if we speak out boldly, you'll soon find you're up against a kingdom of darkness. And things that don't want to be brought to the light. Things that don't want to be publicly known. It's a kingdom of darkness. And you can always tell what Satan has got hold of because you want to hide it. You don't want it exposed to the light. It's a kingdom of disease. God never intended doctors and nurses. Don't know why we place that vocation so high. You know, we have a list of Christian careers, which are right. Have you noticed? Missionaries at the top, minister comes second, doctors and nurses third, teachers fourth, trade unionists right at the bottom. Have you noticed how <laughs> we, we grade what Christians could and should do? Listen, God never intended doctors and nurses. It's, it's a kind of standby. He had to sort of arrange it later. Then I suppose he never intended missionaries or ministers. And in heaven, I'll be out of a job. Because there won't be any need to teach you about God. You'll see him face to face. But we have these grades. But the kingdom of Satan is a kingdom of disease. And Jesus tackled disease from that point of view. This woman whom Satan has had bound for 18 years. It's a kingdom of deception. And I think that Satan does more damage in the church through deception than perhaps any other cause. It's a sobering thought that Evan Roberts of the Welsh Revival said that the Welsh Revival came to nothing because the saints were deceived very soon after the revival. And I ask why many other revivals have frittered out so quickly. And the answer invariably is those who were caught up in the re revival were deceived. Listen, I want to tell you this. Somebody who is baptized in the Holy Spirit is far more open to deception by the kingdom of Satan than someone who hasn't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Because you are now open to supernatural. You're now open to words from beyond. You're now open to prophecy. And Satan is a master at counterfeit. Wherever there is true prophecy, he'll hand in false prophecy. Wherever there's true healing, he'll put in false healing. Wherever there is anything real, he'll put in the counterfeit. But he never bothers to put the counterfeit where there isn't anything real. What's the point? I don't counterfeit half crowns. There'd be no point. Because the real ones have gone out of use. And therefore you find that wherever there's a true prophet like Jeremiah, there may be dozens of false prophets all around him saying other things. And once you are open to prophecy, you're open to false prophecy. Now I say this not to put you off being baptized in the Spirit, but many people just get baptized in the Spirit because they want a bit more joy or they want healing or they want to be guided better. They just don't realize that they're heading for the front line of a warfare. And are often quite unready to deal with it. If you're going to be ready to deal with that spiritual warfare, you've got to stay very close to this book. And you must beware of texts quoted out of context. Satan can quote the Bible better than most of us. But he always quotes the text out of context. And therefore it becomes a pretext for his own ideas. Another safeguard in this warfare against the kingdom of Satan, which as soon as you are baptized in the Spirit, you're right into, is this. There is safety in numbers. Check out all your guidance and your visions and your prophecies. Let others decide. Let others weigh and judge. A man actually came to me after being filled with the Spirit, and he actually tried to tell me, that he'd had a word direct from the Lord that he must leave his wife and go with another woman. Now, I didn't know whether to say rubbish or blasphemy. It was a bit of both. But he was deceived. 
Now we can all be deceived. I, I made a list this morning of the warnings in the New Testament of how you can be deceived. If there was one concern of Jesus, it was that his disciples should not be deceived. Satan plays around with your mind and he'll do it even by quoting texts. And here are some of them. First, if you are a hearer of the word but not a doer of it, you're deceived. James tells you that. So if you listen to all the talks this week and say, oh, wasn't it nice and thank you for the nice talks and very interesting and you do nothing about it, you're deceived. You go home in deception and you've got ground for Satan in your life. You're deceived, says the New Testament, if you say, I've got no sin. I don't need to go forward and ask for forgiveness. I've got nothing to put right. You are deceived. But if you say you're entirely sanctified, if you say, I can't sin in that, that's finished with, then you, you're deceived. The battle will be on to your dying moments. If you think you're something when you're nothing, you're deceived. If you think you're wise when you're foolish, you're deceived. If you say or think you are religious when your tongue is unbridled, you're deceived. I'm just quoting from the New Testament here. If you think you won't reap what you've sown, you're deceived. If you think that you can go on in sin and, and inherit the kingdom, you're deceived. If you think that contact with bad company won't affect you, you're deceived. And I notice that again and again the scripture addresses saintly Christians. Don't be deceived. And, and, and Satan seems to be able to twist doctrine, to unbalance it, to overemphasize one thing at one extreme to the exclusion of the balancing truth in scripture. Listen, Scotland has been the source of many unbalanced truths. Did you know that? really has. I'm going to dare to name one. I just share it with you and I ask you to check it out. The idea that Christians won't ever see the big trouble, that somehow they'll just be caught out of it all and be wafted on the first bus to heaven before any trouble hits them, I believe that is a deception. I'm sorry but I name it. And it started in a prophesying meeting in Port Glasgow here in Scotland. And it's now gone round the world. It seems to have bemused the Americans particularly. I have searched my Bible. I can't find it there. And no Christian ever found it in the Bible for 18 centuries. And if it, if it was there, they'd surely have found it as Christians have searched for it. But it came out of prophesying. And from Port Glasgow it went down to Albury House near Guildford, down in Surrey. And from there it went around the world. Now listen, if I'm wrong, I'd rather be wrong my way and tell you to get ready for trouble than your way. But I believe we've got to test and test and test these things, lest the children of God be deceived. Jesus said in the last days there'll be false prophets, there'll be miracles, counterfeit miracles, because the devil can counterfeit miracles, supernatural things. And Jesus said even the elect could be deceived if that were possible. Now what I'm saying this morning is this. Take the kingdom of God seriously, but also take the kingdom of Satan seriously. Learn to discern the ramifications of that kingdom, the power of it, the reach it has into so many lives, and realize what we're up against. But I must conclude by saying quite simply, there is no question whatever which kingdom is the more powerful. I've said take Satan seriously, but don't ever make the mistake to think that he can ever really challenge God's kingdom. God has given Satan an incredible amount of rope. 
but he'll hang himself with it. God said to Satan, you can touch Job's family. You can even touch him. You can do it. I give you permission. And poor old Job didn't know what had hit him. He couldn't understand what was going on. It didn't look as if God was in charge of his affairs when all his children were killed in a disaster and his health went and everything was just going utterly wrong. And Job had to battle through to believe that God was still in control. He didn't even know that God had given Satan such permission. Listen, Satan can do nothing except by God's permission. He is under. And as we'll see in a later talk, God is calling us to be a demonstration in the world that we belong to a more powerful kingdom. That's what it's all about. To dare to challenge those things of Satan. Why, when I challenged Freemasonry in Surrey, I was told by the Lodge that they would make my life so uncomfortable that I'd have to leave. But it finished up with the Grand Master of the Lodge renouncing it and coming to Christ. Who is more powerful? So I don't want to end on a note of feeling scared of Satan. No. I just say, take your enemy seriously. Viscount Montgomery was never known for humility. He had many other qualities, courage. His power to boost morale was tremendous. And uh, when he had took over at El Alamein during World War II in that funny high-pitched voice, he said, we're going to beat Rommel. And the 8th Army, their morale went up. But Montgomery never underestimated his enemy. He slept in his caravan always with a picture of Rommel his enemy, above his bunk. And when Montgomery came to speak at a school speech day down in Surrey, he said to the boys, the German soldier is the finest fighting soldier in the world and it took someone like me to beat him. <laughs> now I tell you, those boys listening, you know, they straightened their shoulders, lifted up their heads. Listen, I couldn't say that. I'm no match for Satan at all. He can deceive me like he could deceive you. Twist my ideas until I'm serving him, even in preaching, as an angel of light. But listen, Christ has finished him off. Satan bruised Jesus' heel. He hurt him. But Jesus bruised his head with a fatal blow. And I want to come on to that a bit later. So please, I beg you, don't stop coming this morning. The last word is not with Satan. Jesus told us to pray every day, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But you know, Satan managed to get the Lord's Prayer changed. Did you know that? Satan had his own series three version of the Lord's Prayer, series four. And do you know how it goes? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's Satan's version of the Lord's Prayer. And most churches use it. Do you know what Jesus said when he first gave it? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Satan's managed to even deceive people that evil is something rather than someone. So we never mention Satan in the Lord's Prayer now, and Jesus intended us to. And I'm just waiting for some church to get back to the prayer that Jesus pray, taught us to pray. And it isn't the Lord's Prayer. He never prayed that prayer. He couldn't, because he never had to say, forgive us our trespasses. So it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the believer's prayer, as you said, Bernard. But you should finish every day praying, deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen.